won't be long. Better back them up, boy. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that it, uh, it protects us. We thank you, Father, that you left it for us so that whenever we have a question, we can go to your word. We can ask what you would have us to do in any given situation, Father, and you will answer us. You have an answer for everything. Nothing is complicated. Everything is simple, including tying our shoes. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Hallelujah. So how has everybody's week been so far? Good. Some people are making this little face at me and stuff. That's okay. That's right. Yep. I had a lot of divine appointments this week. You know, it's been the kind of those situations where just at the moment that Tamara calls and goes, you know what's going on? I'll go, you know what? God just provided that. He just, he just answered that. He just sent that in. He just... It's been a week of that, not a week of, oh, Lord, what are we going to do? <laughs> well, actually, we've had that too. But, but in that, um, that piece, and David was talking to me about this, this today, is um, the contractor showed up a day early, and he was already halfway down. Yeah, praise the Lord, they showed up. <laughs> it is, it is, <laughs> it is. It is a miracle all by itself if you've been building. Yes, yes, hallelujah. And so, and of course, Scott was on hand to help and assist, and he was able to get down the road, and uh, he was stuck in traffic. David was stuck in traffic. Uh, he's on his way. He was, he's in Austin this evening uh, talking about Israel. He was asked to come down and share with a, a large group of people uh, about Israel and um, our love for Israel and why they should love Israel. And so um, he's with John. He'll be back up here in the morning. So if you have any questions, you can call him then. Praise the Lord. Um, tonight, as um, we get into his word, I, um, I thought about something that Tanya was talking about on Friday night for those that were here. There was, she said a lot of things. You ever notice that you go to church and somebody says a lot of things? <laughs> But there's one thing in the whole message, it might not even have anything to do with anything that we're talking about, but God will just drop stuff in you, and, and he'll deposit those things. And so um, I, I, I like to take notes, but I think notes can be distracting from time to time because I'll get caught up in it, and I think I miss sometimes when the Lord really wants me to just listen. And she was talking about the responsibility of parents. I don't even know what the responsibility was, but it was the responsibility of parents. And how um, we do, we do have, for those of you who still have young ones, you have, you have a huge responsibility. You are, you are raising them, hopefully, training them in the way that they should go, hopefully, the right way, hopefully. They're listening, hopefully. Right. You ever think God thinks that about us sometimes? He's like, okay, here we go again today. We're going to give him the right instruction, and hopefully, Kathleen's going to listen. Hopefully, right? I, I think sometimes. But he's, you know, but God is always hopeful. Are you hopeful of your children? Are, are you, are you, do you expect that they will succeed? You know, and, and so for those of mine who, 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 if you're not my Facebook friend, if you are my Facebook friend, you got to see my oldest son. And my, old, and my oldest son, and it said on the, on the caption, it said, this is why I opened a daycare. And all of his friends, they just got the biggest kick out of this. Because when you see Brian, you would not think about him being my son necessarily. But he's wearing this shirt with a picture of him on it. And it speaks a lot about my son because it really is all about him. And he'll tell you that with no reservation. And he is very confident and very self-aware and he is very irresponsible. <laughs> but I have hope, but I have hope. Actually, he's very responsible. He's just not responsible in the way that I think he should be responsible. Right? You have, you have all these, these, these expectations 
Nancy came to me tonight. Apparently, there's this big family reunion, and so they're going to need counsel beforehand. <laughs> Tom's hiding from me. And so I've been pondering on that thought process as, as to with prayer, right, for family, prayer and fasting for family. That's right. And, and so, you know, we do. And, and every day we have all these things that come about in our lives and um, if it's your children and uh, your expectations of them and how high your bar is, how low your bar is, you know, whatever that is, I'm just glad that the Lord in all his compassion and all his mercy and all of his grace never gives up on us. And we should never give up on him and we should never give up on our children and we should, we should just, we really just should never give up. Sometimes we need to give in. Amen? Sometimes we do need to give in. And so everybody knows, I, the, the title of my message, or at least the top of my piece of paper says, he leads by example. He leads by example. Again, and this has, this has a, a lot um, of implication. Are we following? Do you even know what he's leading you to? Where are you going? You know, every single day. And so, um, Psalm 23, all of us know Psalm 23, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me, right? We all know it. Everybody says that people who have never darkened a doorstep of a church know the Lord's Prayer because they've been to a funeral or they've watched John Wayne or, you know, Roy Rogers. I've heard the Lord's Prayer my whole life. And so, you know, it's always in there. And, but, but truly, it is true. He really is. He is our shepherd. He is leading us, and he is our example. I like, Bud always says, um, I'll ask Bud to do something. He'll go, I'm there, coach. I'm there for you. And, and I think about that a lot. And I, and I looked up the definition of what is a coach. A coach is a person who teaches or trains someone. Um... Sometimes it's, they're training them to do something specific, right? So Lori teaches violin, cello, piano, guitar, probably a few other things. And um, she is, in essence, a coach, and she coaches every week. Then you think about Tanya and Toy, they're, well, Tanya, or Toy, somebody, so, sports system. They're teaching basketball. They're coaching basketball. And so they're coaching a group of individuals. But we have our own private coach all the time, and that is our Lord and Savior. And he always is there, and he is there to teach and train us. God is our coach in life. He gives us instruction. He cheers us on. He always believes that we'll win. He always believes he is our cheerleader right? When we make mistakes, he helps us. He doesn't criticize us. When we disobey, he's even kind in instruction. He doesn't whack us, right? He watches over us. He loves us. He has all the instruction and correction that we need in here. He sent us the Holy Spirit to help us, to watch over us, and to guide us. He gives us everything we need in life to be successful. Where it kind of gets a little messed up is when we decide what that means. We judge and we weigh success. We do it in our children's lives. Our parents did it to us. That's why we do it. Some, some people, and I hear they'll, they'll be talking about their children or their employees, or, and they have expectations, and it's almost like they set them up to fail because their expectations are so high. And it isn't that we shouldn't have high expectations, but when we are training and when we're teaching and when we're learning and when we're instructing, if you've ever instructed anything, it doesn't matter what it is. There is the beginner. And don't we have a lot more patience for a beginner than we do somebody who has been experienced for a while? And then all of a sudden we have no patience and we have no tolerance because they should know better. 
And don't you think God thinks that about us? Do you think, and he doesn't. He, yes, we should know better. But he always looks at us from that place. And that's where like little children, and Tanya talked about that, and how we look at the children and how God looks at us in exactly the same way. He prepares a path for us. He created the air for us to breathe. The fruit was on the tree before we needed it. And he didn't leave us alone. He created a helpmate. Praise the Lord. That's right. The um, definition of coach, a life coach has become a job. There's this job out there. Now, I, I call it ministry. People have been life coaches forever, but now you guess you can make a little bit more money if you have like a little business card and now you're a life coach, right? And a life coach is simply an advisor who helps people make decisions, set and reach goals, or deal with problems. Would you like to be paid to do that? Anybody? Every day, you want to help people make decisions, you want to help them set and reach goals, or do, and deal with their problems. Really, nobody in here probably really wants that job, right? We got enough dealing with their own stuff, let alone that that would be our job every day. But I think about it, Wendy deals in insurance, and every day you do that for people. Really, every day we do that for everybody we encounter. We help them make decisions. You help people make decisions. You know, just going to a four-way stop sign. Somebody, please go. Or use your blinker so I know if I can go, right? Every day, there are simple things in life, and then there's very complex things in life. Our very first coaches in life were our parents. They were supposed to be responsible. They were supposed to help us make decisions every day, right? For, and every day, they were supposed to help us to make decisions for ourselves, they were not supposed to be telling us our whole life what we should be doing. And so I'm not going to look at anybody. But if you have grown children and you're still telling them what to do all the time, you might need to cut that string. My mom and my dad, sometimes I think about the decisions that they left in my hands. It is amazing that I live and stand and breathe before you today. My mom just thought we should decide for ourselves what we wanted to believe about anything. She really wasn't going to give us any foundation, so, you know, in the word. And, um, but yet here I am. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Because I had another coach who was also looking out for me, right? And that was my father in heaven. And he picked up where my parents didn't fail, but that they just didn't give it. What's that, Diane? Fumbled. Dropped the ball. They did kind of, their coaching wasn't, yes. That's right. But you know, they had their own stuff going on. You know, my father was an alcoholic. My mom decided she was fed up with that. You know, so she packs us all up and moves us all out. And, you know, and they're going through their stuff. You know, when kids, they don't understand none of this stuff, nor should they understand any of this stuff. You know, but there are points in people's lives where we do neglect the gift. We do neglect the ability to be able to help people. And it's in those times that you have such a strong adversary that stands before you that can help you out. There are many decisions that we make every day for ourselves and others that really can affect the fabric of time. We can make decisions that are irreversible, so to speak. You ever say something you wish you hadn't said? You know? So, and um, it's kind of like, did I say that out loud? You know? And, and you, can't, you can't take it back. You can't take it back. It's out there. You've said it. And um, you've done things, you know, which stand behind you. And we're forgiven, but sometimes they really do. They, they really affect a lot of people. A lot of people don't think that. They think that they, what they do in their life really affects no one else but themselves. They're not hurting anyone but themselves. 
And we realize through um, death and suicide and tragedy in people's lives that it affected more people than they thought. And it is always those who are lost and alone. In 2 Corinthians 2.14, it says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. And we talk about this a lot. We talk about the influence that we have. Um, Pastor shares... Tanya shares with the kids, we share with the kids how we, we do influence one another for the good and for the bad. And we always want to be good influences. We always want to be good examples. You know, we, we stand here or we sit here and we worship and we talk about how we're going to lift God up. And, and the world's going to see him through us. And um, that is what God wants. But God really... When, when you look at how he has intended on leading us throughout the word, in Romans 12, 8, it says, he who exhorts is an exhorter. He who gives with liberality, who, who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. The Lord, and I talked about that earlier, that the Lord is our cheerleader. He is always there rooting us on. He is always exhorting us. He gives so liberally in our lives. He gives us loves. He gives us what we need to perform and do whatever he, you want to do in your life every day. He shows mercy. He's diligent to be with us always, and he's always cheerful about it. And I always think, I think it's sad when I hear people that were raised with a God who was always mad at them, they thought, or they were taught, and that um, was always, you know, going to, they were always going to be in trouble because they never could overcome, they were never perfect, they were just Christians. I see, you know, the bumper sticker, I had it one time on a truck before I knew better, and it says, I'm, I'm not perfect, I'm just forgiven, and the Bible says that he has called us. And he has given us the ability to be righteous and to be perfect. And so um, I, I started really looking at and hearing people with excuses, excuses for blessings. You know, God has blessed me. And, but, you know, I had to work really hard and all this. Why couldn't God just bless you? Why isn't it okay just for God to just overwhelm you with his love and his peace and his grace, you don't, you know, there's not a reason. It's not because there's something that you did or needed to do, but there's a lot of people that feel that way, that there has to be a reason why God would bless Matt and, and, and not bless Preston. I know, I know you're blessed and I know you're blessed, you know, and um, as different things in life happen, um, sometimes I think it's difficult to remember that God's got it. And I love the fact that I have been taught that, that God's got it. He's got every situation. I don't maneuver through that very well all the time, though. You know, I can stand up here and preach a good word, but I can get just as worried as the last person about finances, about sickness, about them nine puppies down there <laughs> that are fixing to wear me out already. 3 a.m., I'm up with the puppies because it's raining. So I got to go down there. Now, I couldn't just lay in bed and go, oh, hey, Lord, why don't you take care of them puppies down there? Because the Lord didn't leave the fan on, you know, while it's raining and all of, now all the puppies are all wet and I've got to change bedding and, you know, move everybody around and all the dogs are all just a mess down there. There are things in the natural we do have to take care of. There are things... So then there's that other side of that. There's those people who think God's not going to do anything for them and life is miserable and we're going to die one day and then, oh, praise the Lord, we're going to heaven. And then there's those people that just sort of float through life. You hear them saying it anyway. They act to me like they're floating through life. I just don't have to do anything. God's just got it all under control. I'm just going to stay at home and God's going to call and give me a job and 
God's going to, you know, fix this and God's going to fix that. And you know, the truth of the matter is he probably will. But my perception of that is that they're not, maybe not doing enough. I don't know if you could hear that in my voice, in my tone, but it, 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 I, it I'll venture over into judgment, just like everybody else. And so I really, have to, I really have to watch myself. I have to check my heart. I have to make sure that, that you know, when I have a, something where I'm judging just somebody's very existence of that, you know, well, I need a job. Well, you know, are you looking for a job? No, God's going to give me a job. I'm just going to wait and sit here. And all of a sudden I'm thinking, oh, you know, you really need to go out and you need to, you know, apply for some jobs. You need to do this. Well, who am I to tell anybody what they need to do, right? Or think about that. It doesn't affect me, Right? And so, um, that's what the enemy does to us all the time. Because especially when we're uh, working in a place to where we know the truth, we can very easily slip into being very judgmental and not letting the Lord lead us and give people the same consideration that God gives us every single day. Turn over to John 10. 1 through 5. John 10, 1 through 5. In the New King James, it says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. I've heard the scripture touched on a couple times over the past couple months. And one of the things that the Lord impressed upon me was that, yep, they, verse 5, yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him. People who don't have a relationship with the Lord, they, they don't know, they don't follow God. And a lot of times we can, give it, we can give biblical advice to people who don't have a personal relationship with God, and they will be led astray because they think that they're they're being led by God. And this isn't just people who don't have relationships. This is also people in the body of Christ. You know, uh, well, I've prayed about it, and I have a peace about it. And, and, and sometimes I can hear, and I can see, and I know within myself, I will ha actually hesitate to say that. Um, normally, if, if somebody asks me a question, I just have an answer. I really don't have to pray about too much. And that isn't about me, okay? So don't, don't take this personally. If, if you do that, if you go, okay, well, you know, let me pray about that. Let me pray about that. If I got to pray about it, it means I don't want to do it. Now, that might not be you, okay? It may not be you, but I'm just telling you, you know? And so I kind of quit doing that because really I don't got to pray about nothing. I don't want to do it. So all I'm doing is giving you some phony Bible excuse. I'm going to pray about it. And I'm just going to call you up and give you some other excuse. I'm a whole lot better off right then to just say, you know, I just don't feel led to do that. No, yes, Fonda's back there going. Yeah, you know, it's okay to say no. You know, what is it? The enemy's always trying. He will overload you. He will overtax you with unnecessary guilt Selfishness. Anybody in here strong-willed? Oh, half the place, praise the Lord. Oh, he's pointing to you. That's okay. He's just helping you. He's your helpmate. All right? That's right. He's helping you. And so, strong-willed can be a good thing. Oh, oh, oh. This is why I don't wear this thing. Huh? All right, there we go. Um, being strong-willed, is it being strong-headed? You, you know that term? Nothing can get through, right? The thickness of your skull, being hard-headed. 
And um, sometimes resolve, um, it's really about knowing, it's really about knowing yourself. Are you honest with yourself? Can you be honest with yourself and know yourself and, and know that if I accept that, whatever it is, that that's going to overload my basket and then I'm going to be stressed out? Or do you think, oh, I'm the only person that can help this person do this? And when you start, when you do that, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble. And the enemy loves to do that to us. And so there's all this false sense of duty that he puts on Christians that we have to be very careful of. And um, not every opportunity that sets before us is an opportunity from God. I'm not saying it's a bad opportunity, but you always need to look at them and you need to weigh them. And is this really something that I should be doing? Is this really what, is this what God wants me to do? And we have a lot of opportunities here at the church. There's a lot of things that people can do uh, or not do. And um, we talk about them. And as you're led to do something, then you will do it. I did ask Billy today if he would help my husband pull electrical wire. Because at 7 a.m., David thought that I should help him pull this electrical wire. And Billy, he's like, oh, no, oh, no. You know, oh, no. And I told him, I told David, you know, he calls me, you know, and so we got the cell phone in the window because we can't get reception, and he's giving me instructions. Okay, every wife in here knows this. Just I won't even look at none of you. Or vice versa. And so he's giving me instructions, like backing up the trailer. You know, you know, into the hole. Just don't, you know, I can do it. I can do it myself. It's not being strong-willed. It's not being insubordinate. It's just that sometimes you do better, right, if somebody beside your spouse teaches you to do stuff. So I, I understand pulling wire, okay? I understand. But this, the wire, everybody can, when you leave church, you can go, I'll show you, okay? You couldn't pull the wire, I mean, I pulled the wire, but the wire wouldn't pull. And so he's, you know, so I can hear him on the speakerphone, pull the wire. I'm pulling the wire. Well, pull the wire. I am pulling the wire. The wire won't pull. What do you mean the wire won't pull? Well, the wire won't pull. I, I just don't, I don't understand why the wire won't pull. Pull the wire. So the wire won't pull. And we had this conversation for 10 minutes. Seriously, Right? And so he, he goes, oh, I can hear it. So he gets up here. He goes, I just don't understand why you could, what the deal was with pulling the wire. So I told you, you can't pull the wire. So he reaches in there and he goes, oh. Well, I don't understand why the wire won't pull. I don't understand why the wire won't pull. And so we do that with God all the time. Well, God, I asked you, I needed you to do this. I, I just don't understand, Lord. I, I, I believe, I've been receiving, I've been praying, I, I just don't understand. Where's it at? How come it's not coming through? Where's the answer? You know, it's, it's no different than that little piece of wire. And so, and, and so we're, you know, we're talking to him, like on the cell phone, right? And we're arguing with God about something that God understands really isn't going to happen. And we do this all the time. And that's when we have to have patience with one another, right? Anybody have to have patience with their mate? Everybody does. You have to have patience with your children. You have to have patience with the person making your coffee or cooking your food wrong, right? You have to have, you have, to have patience and you have to walk in love, just as God does. And so we have a tendency with one another to be a little snippy. Hmm? Yeah, right? We shouldn't do that. We should, we, should, we should give everybody the same grace. We should give our relationships the same grace. And when Jesus said here, going back to the scripture, that God has a way and we will hear him, and we'll know the direction to go. We need to always be listening. 
just like today, I could say the wire doesn't pull 15 different ways in 15 different tones of voice with more fluctuation, with a stronger attitude, <laughs> and it wouldn't have made a difference because the wire wasn't going to pull. And so if you're in a place right now with the Lord where you feel like you're just, you've just beat, been beating the subject up, whatever it is, whether it's a job or finances or your children or, um, you know, the little things in life or the big things in life, that I realize whenever I'm frustrated, I'm really not listening to God. So whenever I get frustrated, I haven't taken the time to really just go, you know, Lord, I'm frustrated with this. You know, God wants you, you know, he'll take, he'll understand, he understands frustration. He understands your frustration. He created us. He gave us these emotions to be helpful, not to rule us and to drive us. In Matthew 5.10, it says when, that, um, when he spoke to them, he said, hear and understand. Jesus was constantly telling his disciples, hear me. A lot of times we hear people and we don't listen to their heart and to the situation. In Matthew 15, 14, Jesus talks about the fact that there are leaders out there, there are people out there that are blind to the truth of who God is and they're leading people blindly. And the blind leading the blind. And Jesus said, just leave them alone. And don't try to correct the situation. And I'm not real sure why he had that in, this, in my message tonight, but I know it was for someone that needed to hear that they were trying to help somebody with a situation where they were receiving advice from someone who wasn't giving them good advice, and they weren't going to listen to the advice that you wanted to give them. Isaiah 48, 17 says, Thus says the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One in Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way you should go. And so this week, just remember that he wants to teach you. He wants you to profit. He wants to give you the proper instruction. It's raining. Praise the Lord. I have the fans on down on the puppies. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Let God show you. Don't try and do it on your own. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand. Hallelujah. Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. So it does not matter what it is that you need tonight when you bring it to him and you ask him. So uh, whether it's a prayer request um, or if you need healing in your body, everyone who asks receives. Is the word true? Is all the word true? Yes. So if Jesus said, For everyone who asks receives and everyone who seeks finds, it means that we don't have to wait for whatever the answer is that we need. Quit waiting and just let God do it. Sometimes we need to get out of the way, and sometimes we really haven't asked the right question. Sometimes we've asked the right question and we didn't like the answer. So now we're stuck in the question mode again. Oh, no, I didn't like that answer, Lord. I want another one. I want another one. And then you're still asking the same question a year from now of the Lord. What should I do about this when the Lord's already told you what to do? You guys hear from God. I'm not in a room of people who don't hear from the Lord. You may not listen to him, but you hear him. And so this is me too, folks. We need to always listen. Be quick to listen, right? Slow to speak and walk in love. Amen. Father, I just thank you for your word. I thank you that it is true. 
I pray over the offering tonight, Father. I pray over the needs of this church, the body of believers that are here, Father, within my voice, that whatever need it is, Father, we just read that when we ask of you that we will have an answer. We will receive what we need to take care of the situation, that nothing is too big for you, Father. And we thank you that we rely on you, that you are our shepherd. We are not led astray by blind teachers. We know the truth, and the truth will always set us free. I ask an anointing, Father, because I know that there's somebody in here that you've ministered to me that is seeking a really big life change decision tonight, Father. And I thank you that, that you've already told them that it's coming, but that they don't see the direction that it's go, that where it's coming from. And I just ask, Father, for peace in their hearts and peace in their mind as they wait upon you in this decision, that you've already laid the path, you've already put the things in order to take care of this decision for them, Father. And help them to not worry because they love you and they know you got it, but it's just hard sometimes. Help us to reach out to those people this week, Father, that are in the valley of indecision, that we can help them with the truth of what they need to know. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. If you have a need, if you need prayer, don't leave here without it. Have a blessed rest of your week and enjoy the rain. Hallelujah. As you've watched today, you've had the opportunity to hear the word preached. And as you apply that word, you'll get victory in your life. But it has to start someplace. It has to start first with a commitment to Jesus Christ as making him your Savior and then making him the Lord of your life. Paul said this in Romans 10, 8 through 10. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you and it's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Well, the word of faith that Paul preached is found in the next verses. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. For with a mouth confession is made unto salvation, and with a heart one believes unto righteousness. So it goes like this. All you have to do is actually say, Jesus is my Savior and he is my Lord. So I'm going to invite you to say this with me this morning. Uh, and if you want to bow your head, you can bow your head. The Bible says that pray watching. And so it's okay to keep your eyes open and, and watch. But let's say this together. Say, Father, I know that you sent Jesus to die for my sins. I confess those sins today. I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of those sins and to come into my heart and be my Savior. And I commit today that I will make you the Lord of my life. Thank you for salvation today. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you said that today for the first time, no matter what time of the day or night it is, uh, welcome to the family. Welcome to knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now from this day on, make him the Lord of your life. And as you make him the Lord of your life, you will find out what God can do in you and through you. Also, if you've watched this broadcast, we want you to know that you can become a partner with this ministry. As you become a partner with this ministry, some of the things that you've seen throughout this uh, presentation... Uh, the buck outs and, and things like that, then you become a part of that kind of ministry. And there's many people that come to know Jesus. We have offices in Nigeria and Togo, have four churches in Nigeria, one in, in Togo. And uh, we want you to know that you become a part of each and everything that this ministry does when you become a partner. You can see the information right there on your screen so that you're able to become a covenant partner with us. And as you do, we want you to know that we pray over each and every one of your offerings so that God will multiply it back to your hands according to his word. His word says in Luke 6, 38, that he gives back, pressed down, shaken together, 
running over to make room for more. The New Living Translation says whatever measure you use in giving large or small, it'll be used to measure what is given back to you. So we want you to know that God loves you, he'll take care of you, and he'll multiply the seed that you sow in this ground with this ministry. Remember that Jesus is Lord and Jesus loves you and so do we.